This is a land where the weak are enslaved and killed. Violence is every man's daily bread, and a dead husband is every woman's dream. Here children expect to be beaten for their own good, sometimes to death. This is the fabled warrior kingdom of Sparta. Soon it will be the unlikely savior of the free world. The cradle of Western civilization is under attack. King Xerxes and his quarter of a million strong Persian army are invading Greece. In the first major struggle between East and West, the slave-owning Spartans and their King Leonidas will be transformed into glorious heroes. Over the next two and a half thousand years, their heroic stand will become a legend. The two forces would meet at Thermopylae, the gates of fire, and on the outcome would hang the fate of Western democracy itself. This is Thermopylae, the scene of one of the most glorified slaughters in history. Many thousands died here. The smell of death and decay still hangs in the air as sulfurous hot springs pour their stench down the mountainside, giving the battlefield its name, Thermopylae, the hot gates, the gates of fire. A solitary figure surveys the battlefield. One of the greatest heroes of antiquity, the Spartan king, Leonidas. Here, Leonidas took on the might of the Persian Empire with just a tiny Greek defense force and stopped it in its tracks. Legend says that Leonidas' struggle against King Xerxes saved Western democracy at the very moment of its birth. The minute it happened, it immediately vaulted into legend. We look back 2,500 years and it seems ancient, it seems mythological to us. We can't even tell if it's real or if it, but it really happened. It was a historical event. We know who was there, we know the names, it really happened. But with Thermopylae, few facts are certain. Almost all we know about the battle and the Spartans themselves comes from the ancient historian Herodotus writing from a Greek perspective more than 40 years after the battle. Herodotus was responding to stories that he was told by the Spartans when he visited Sparta. And the Spartans had already put together their version of events by the time Herodotus came to write his history. So, Herodotus himself was gathering a partly mythologized version. The legend of the Spartans at the Battle of Thermopylae reverberated down the ages. Historians and artists transformed Leonidas and his men into mythical figures until their battle for Greece became seen as a fight for the entire Western world. In the Western imagination, the story of Thermopylae is the most important example of heroic self-sacrifice for country. The simple message is that it's better to be dead than unfree. Leonidas came from a secretive and violent society, totally at odds with the rest of Greece. Their presence at one of the key battles for freedom has intrigued Western scholars for centuries. For 2,500 years, people have been arguing about them, never agreeing as to who they were, what they did, why they did it. The Spartans have left a wonderful mythical paper trail that nobody has really succeeded in sorting out.
Today, very little remains of Sparta, the most isolated and secretive city-state in ancient Greece. But in Leonidas's time, this remote valley was home to the most feared warriors in the Mediterranean. And unlike other Greeks, who spent most of the year farming, all Spartans were full-time warriors. Every time you faced the Spartan army, you faced a mass of identically, perfectly trained Spartans. You were not really confronting even mortal man. You were confronting sort of this eternal notion of unbeatable Sparta. Leonidas was master of his own realm and feared in many more, but his supremacy was about to be challenged. Persia was the largest empire the Western world had ever seen. From its center in modern-day Iran, it stretched from India to Egypt. Greece was just a tiny speck on its western horizon. Persia was a world empire. It included 28 nations. It had all the resources it ever wanted. It had all the money it ever wanted and controlled something that nobody before them had ever controlled. The Persians looked like they could take over the world, but it would be some years before they realized that they would have to get past the Spartans first. In Sparta, Persia would find a military machine like no other. Closed to the outside world, Sparta's people thought they were a chosen super race, and with extreme laws and ideals, they plan to stay that way. To maintain discipline, everyone in Sparta was always under surveillance. A group of ultra-conservative old men called the Gorousia looked for signs of non-conformity. Watching the Gorousia was another group of officials, the Ephors. Even royalty wasn't above suspicion. A Spartan king wasn't a monarch. It was a diarchy. There were two of them, carefully watching each other, being rivals, and knowing that if they stepped out of line, the ephors might get them. The king could be put on trial, could be exiled, and his character systematically ruined in the eyes of history. No one escaped Sparta's judgmental gaze. All babies were examined to check that they conformed to the Spartan ideal. At the age of seven, a boy would have been removed from his family and taught the Spartan ways. Young Spartans were brought up and educated communally by the state from, uh, we're told, the age of seven. And uh, this education was intended to inculcate physical toughness, um, military skill, and above all, obedience. Living together in barracks, the boys learned comradeship. And deprived of all comforts, they were molded into austere Spartans through extreme physical hardship. The boys were deliberately given not enough to eat, and also they were encouraged to steal to augment their uh, meager rations, and uh, they were whipped if they were caught. Not because stealing was a crime, but because they were clumsy thieves. The eyes of Sparta were everywhere. When a boy reached puberty, he was considered to be particularly dangerous. The boys were always supervised, every moment of every day. Spartans felt that boys, teenagers, were at a particularly dangerous age. They might go off the rails. They had to be policed every minute to make sure that the values of the ruling group were transmitted. 
Spartan girls were given some sort of formal education and they had some sort of exercise allegedly naked in front of the boys. them to be when they married and they married late by Greek standards educated brought up in such ways to be able to survive the rigors of childbirth ideally they gave birth to boys because Sparta was a fundamentally military society so the whole system is geared to producing the largest number of physically fittest fighting males One of the things that always amazes me is that they ever managed to produce any children because they were encouraged to go into sort of military homosexual relationships until they were allowed to marry. The Spartans might well be fighting next to their boyfriends. Homosexuality was thought to bind men to their peers. It was your job, with your shield and your spear, to guard your lover. That was part of the cement that kept the Spartan battle line together. Homosexuality was very common in Sparta and was positively looked on, provided it didn't stop men breeding. The Spartan population was perilously small. And so there were laws designed to spice up the sex lives of married couples. A Spartan man wasn't allowed to see his wife in daylight for the first 10 years or so of their marriage. A man was encouraged to see his wife as a splendid sex object. Emotional development was something they didn't want because families were the source of peculiarity. Spartans wanted to produce similars. They wanted them wheeling on the battlefield with one mind like a flock of birds. Sparta's invincible military reputation had been built up by conquering the surrounding lands of Messenia and Laconia and turning their old neighbors into slaves, forcing them to work their fields. Messenia became the free bread basket for Sparta, which meant that the Spartan upper military class could devote their entire existence to military training and defense of the realm. The whole of Spartan society became dependent on slavery. 8,000 Spartan overlords suppressed a quarter of a million slaves. These were the Helots. Drastically outnumbered, the Spartans faced the constant threat of a Helot uprising. Every year, the Spartans declared war on the Helots. They had no intention of killing them. Their economy rested on the Helots, and so did a lot of their love lives. But it had to be religiously permissible to kill a Helot. And the great time for doing that was at night, because that was the time of greatest terror. The Spartans were connoisseurs of terror, and the Helots had to be intimidated. At night, young Spartans patrolled in death squads. The faceless assassins were known as the Cryptea. But keeping the Helots in check would soon become secondary to the trouble unfolding across the sea. Back in Persia, a new king was being crowned. Xerxes sought to emulate the expansionist ambitions of his father's reign. 
Herodotus records his declaration. It was by taking risks that my ancestors brought us to where we stand today. We, therefore, are following in the footsteps of our fathers. We shall conquer all Europe, and we shall return home in triumph. Xerxes ordered his generals to prepare for war against Greece. It would be the largest invasion force ever seen, and Xerxes himself would lead it. Men from every corner of the Persian Empire were ordered to muster for Xerxes' cause. Tens of thousands of archers, horsemen, and even Greek mercenaries gathered in preparation for a massive attack. As news of Persia's preparations for invasion grew, the threat to Greek civilization could no longer be ignored. Leonidas went north to Corinth to meet a group of his Greek rivals. Their immediate thought was how to save their skins and Greeks being Greeks at that time, what they would have thought was, how can I save my city? Leonidas knew that Sparta's basic instinct to withdraw to its homeland wouldn't work against Xerxes. It probably would have been very tempting for the Spartans when faced with these unimaginably large numbers from the Persian Empire to defend just their home territory. But they had no worthwhile fleet. Sparta could be surrounded by an enemy who landed from the sea. Sparta had to have an ally with a big fleet, and that meant Athens. For Athens to help Sparta, Leonidas would have to come to an agreement with his former enemy. But although he was willing to lead a small alliance of Greek states against the Persians, he did not have the authority to provide the troops to support them. Over the coming weeks, he would have to convince his Spartans of the need for the Greeks to work together. If you were a Spartan and one of your kings came back and said they want us to march over 250 miles to the north and stop the Persians, whom they had never seen before, to save Greeks that they didn't know very well, most of them would have probably said no. The Spartans considered themselves separate, unique, special. The idea that they would even fight alongside other peoples, other Greeks, was a new concept. But by now, it was becoming clear just how great the threat was. There's a story about two Greek spies who obviously weren't very professional, they were caught. And what Xerxes did in his absolute confidence was to show them round. Nothing could have prepared the spies for the sight of the Persian army. They would have seen the place of gathering of this massive, I believe it's well over 50 different nationality, uh, imperial army. When they'd seen the enormous preparations, they would go back and tell the people back home, oh, you might as well give in. You know, this is a juggernaut. This is too big for any of us. With four years of preparations complete, Xerxes finally embarked on his invasion. Entering Greece from the north, he hoped to sweep down the coast, shadowed by his Persian fleet. But first, he had to cross the Hellespont Strait between Europe and Asia Minor. Xerxes simply ordered that the Hellespont be bridged. His engineers lashed together hundreds of boats. This was unheard of. It was just absurd in the eyes of a Greek. But for the Persians, it was part and parcel of the whole army work that there were people who could provide anything that was necessary to shift an army as efficiently as possible. And if that required a bridge across the Hellespont, that was done. 
two huge bridges were floated, both over two miles long. But just as the task was complete, the gods, or at least nature, intervened. Herodotus records that a sudden violent storm turned the boats to matchwood. He writes that Xerxes was so enraged, he had the Hellespont whipped and branded with a hot iron. But the resources of the Persian Empire were limitless. Within a month, the Hellespont was bridged again. Xerxes had everything going for him. He did not face a concerted military attempt to block him at the bridgehead, which would have created real problems for him. He crossed completely unopposed. Nothing now stood between Xerxes and mainland Greece. As the Persian threat loomed ever closer to Sparta, it's said that King Leonidas went to ask the gods for help in defeating Xerxes. He went north to consult the country's most potent religious symbol, the oracle at Delphi. The Delphic Oracle is the most sacred seat of prophecy in the entire Greek world. When the Spartan king visited the Oracle, he would have been surrounded by a huge entourage. This would have been an incredibly exciting and intense and semi-public event, so they would have all have been there, desperate to know what the Oracle said. The whole experience was heightened by the preparatory rituals that went on beforehand, a sacrifice, scattered water, and a pathway down some secret steps into a subterranean prophetic chamber. Leonidas went to hear the most important prophecy of his life. It came from the god Apollo, speaking through a revered priestess. Steam or smoke arose around her, and then she went into some kind of trance or hypnotic state and uttered the most extraordinary noises. They're often referred to as noises like a dog barking or growling, which are then, in fact, interpreted by the male priests of Apollo to the visitor. Herodotus relates what the oracle prophesied for Leonidas, but the prophecy was disastrous. Hear your fate, O oh dwellers in Sparta of the wide spaces. Either your famed great town must be sacked by Persia's sons, or the whole of Sparta shall mourn the death of a king of the house of Heracles. When Leonidas consulted the oracle, the news was terrible. The Delphic oracle simply said, either a Spartan king must die, or Sparta itself will fall. If Leonidas was going to fight, he would have to act soon. Xerxes' vast army was thundering through Greece, crushing anyone who stood in their way. There's little doubt that a provincial Greek used to armies of a few thousand would have been gobsmacked when he watched the passage of the army of Xerxes, which would have taken days just to walk past one spot. But Leonidas had yet to persuade the Spartans to send troops to Thermopylae. The next Carneo festival was imminent, and fighting would be forbidden under Spartan warrior code. They weren't going to leave, in our terms, the Christmas or Easter celebrations behind, because they could expect the gods to punish them if they didn't carry through the celebration of God's great occasions. Spartans usually hated fighting abroad. They had a massive population of slaves they had to control at home. Keeping the helots under control was more important than taking on a distant empire. They were constantly scared of helot revolts. 
And this meant that they were very shy indeed of doing any kind of foreign policy, of any kind of foreign adventurism. But with Xerxes' Persian army thundering south, Leonidas had no choice. Some of Sparta's elite warriors would have to go north. The Spartans probably thought that if they didn't send anyone, uh, that no Greeks would go, that um, Sparta is the leading military state and with the military leadership, the land leadership uh, uh, in its hands had to set an example. Only 300 hardened fighters were chosen to go with Leonidas to head off Xerxes' hordes. Most people believe that there was 300 as an advance guard that would show Spartan intent seriousness and then if it went well they would send back word and more Spartans would come but I think everybody would have known that anybody who goes north and marches up to northern Greece to face an army that was anywhere from a hundred to two hundred thousand soldiers knows they're gonna die in early August 480 BC King Leonidas 300 Spartans and an unknown number of helot slaves left their sacred homeland and set off for Thermopylae. Women were actually out there ordering their men to come home victorious. The famous saying of the Spartan wife is with it or on it, meaning that her husband must come home with his shield or dead on it and certainly not come home as a deserter. All Spartans were trained killers, but the 300 were not just picked for their ability on the battlefield. There was a special requirement made for the men who were picked to fight at Thermopylae. They had to be fathers of sons. Perhaps the Spartans felt that a father with sons had already done their duty for the future of Sparta. These men were almost expendable. As they marched north, the Spartans knew that the odds were against them, but they entrusted their fate to their gods. The most religious people in Greece, they always took herds of sacrificial animals with them so they could read the omens for battle in the shape of the animals' livers. Normally before a battle, if the liver wasn't the right shape, Spartans wouldn't start the fight. And then the fight wouldn't start because a Greek enemy would never provoke the Spartans to war. This time, it wasn't up to the Spartans when the battle started. They were on the defense. Inspired by their example, other city-states rallied to the cause. Athens had already agreed to send its formidable navy, while other allies such as Thebes and Thespi swelled the infantry ranks to over 4,000. Even so, according to the account given by the Greek historian Herodotus, the Spartans and their allies were still outnumbered by over 500 to 1 by land and 3 to 1 at sea. By the middle of August 480 BC, steep mountains rose before them. They had reached Thermopylae. Hot springs poured down the mountainside, giving Thermopylae its name, Thermopylae, the gates of fire. No one knows exactly what Thermopylae was like in Leonidas' time, but the sea was said to come up to the mountains leaving only a narrow path along the coast. A small army could block it with ease. A natural bottleneck, Thermopylae was the last defendable position on Xerxes' road to Athens. The Greek plan was simple. They intended to block the way south along a defensive line that stretched from Thermopylae on land across a narrow channel of water to the island of Artemisium. They came up with the battle plan of holding the line of Artemisium by sea connected 
with Thermopylae by land, and it was a good plan. Holding the line by sea was the Athenian navy. Defending it by land were the Spartans. Leonidas ordered his men to block Thermopylae's coastal path. They started by rebuilding an old defensive wall. His plan was to turn the pass at Thermopylae into a narrow funnel of death, creating a killing zone, which he hoped would trap and neutralize the Persians' vast numerical superiority. Next, Leonidas addressed the one potential weakness in the plan. Known only to the local Greeks, there was a secret track that led over the mountains to behind the Spartan position. Anxious to keep his own troops on the front line, Leonidas took a gamble and sent only a small contingent of Phocian allies to guard it. With the battle plan now in place, the waiting game began. For King Leonidas, Thermopylae was not just a good defensive position. It was a place of real personal significance. Leonidas believed that he was a direct descendant of the son of Zeus, Heracles, who spent his last days at Thermopylae. When Leonidas goes to Thermopylae, he's conscious that over the hot spring is a massive altar of his own great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, Heracles. Behind him is Mount Oita, which is the place where Heracles actually died. He sacrificed himself on the top of the mountain towering over Thermopylae. Down below where the ships are moored on Cape Sepias, that is where Heracles, no less, was put off to collect water by Jason and the Argonauts. Heracles' presence is everywhere, and he is actually an ancestor. Meanwhile, Xerxes' quarter of a million strong Persian army was well fed from stockpiles of rations dispatched by special boats months earlier. As they advanced inexorably through northern Greece, city after city paid homage, supplying dinner and entertainment for the great king and up to 15,000 members of his close royal circle. By late August 480 BC, Xerxes reached Thermopylae, and still no sword had been raised against him. Now, thousands of Persian campfires ranged across the plains to the north of Leonidas' position. All that separated the two armies was Thermopylae's narrow coastal path. When Xerxes got to Thermopylae, he did not seek battle as soon as he arrived. He waited, and he waited. We're told in the end that he waited until the fifth day. And the reason why he was waiting was because he simply could not believe that a puny Greek force, when it saw the full might of Persia, would not simply turn tail and run. Spartans were trained never to run from a fight. Herodotus, the first Greek historian, tells of a Greek scout who saw the massed Persian hordes and fled back to the Spartan camp, where a warrior called Dionikes was standing guard. He tells that the Persians are so numerous that when their archers fire a volley, the shafts literally block out the sun. And Dionikes says, good, then we'll have our battle in the shade. Although some of the other Greeks wanted to leave, under Leonidas' watchful eye, the Allies stood firm. On the other side of Thermopylae, the Persians had now been waiting for the Greeks to surrender for three days. According to Herodotus, Xerxes grew impatient and sent a spy to the Greek camp. He was baffled by their refusal to be intimidated by his army. The spy came across a group of Spartans performing a bizarre ritual. Spartans happened to be dressing their hair, and they paid no attention to him whatsoever. They let him ride up, check them out, and ride back. He was completely stunned. And so was Xerxes when he got that, that these soldiers seemed to be treating him with absolute contempt. 
be seen combing their hair in the face of the enemy was a sign that they were not frightened. And that was one of the Spartans' chief weapons in war. We do not fear you. It is for you to run away. On the fifth morning, Xerxes decided to put an end to this strange Greek behavior. He gave the order for his men to advance. Short of victory, he took up a position overlooking the battlefield. Scribes prepared to note down who fought well and deserved reward, and who did badly and should be punished. Unlike Xerxes, Leonidas marched to war beside his men. Against the Persians, Spartan training and discipline would be tested to the limit. Battle-hardened comrades placed their lives in each other's hands once again. The first troops the Persians sent to face the Greeks were amongst their weakest. Ill-equipped, they were ordered to squeeze into the narrow pass and advance towards the Spartans. Leonidas and his men packed tightly together, blocking the pass with a phalanx formation. Lines of men with spears bristling above overlapping shields. When the two narrow front lines collided, the Persians soon found that their short javelins and wicker shields were no match for disciplined Spartans armed with nine-foot spears. So you really have kind of a, a chopping machine that is simply moving forward almost blindly. When a line of Spartans confronted a line of more lightly armed uh, soldiers, it was absolutely bloody. It was really uh, like uh, a feeding meat into a meat grinder. Leonidas's choice of Thermopylae was working well. The important thing about Thermopylae is this enormous mountain flank rising. One of the great problems for the Persians, brilliantly utilized by Leonidas, was that half of them actually fell off and fell over into the shoals below before they could even fight. But as rank after rank of the Persian army fell, it soon became clear that they had vastly underestimated Spartan military prowess. Had they been fighting on the open plains on horseback, it would have been another story. But in these narrow confines, the Greek heavy armor, the massed phalanx, the Persians didn't have an answer to that. And I'm sure the Greeks were just slaughtering them by, you know, it's almost as fast as they could plunge their spears over their shoulders. Trapped in the narrow pass, the advancing Persian troops were being annihilated, unable to take advantage of their vastly superior numbers. When Xerxes looked at this, the first thing he would see literally thousands of warriors that he couldn't use because the nature of the pass was so narrow. The problem he must have very quickly noticed was that he sends people down this corridor, they kill him, he sends people down, they kill him. There was no end to it. Frustrated, by late afternoon, Xerxes decided to send in the cream of his army to unblock the pass an elite force that included members of his own family. Some 10,000 strong, the Greeks called them immortals. As soon as one man was killed, another immediately took his place. But even Persia's elite troops were no match for the Spartans. As the two crack forces closed in on each other, the Spartans performed an audacious counter-maneuver In the middle of the battle, they pretended to retreat. One of the interesting things about Thermopylae is for the first and perhaps the only occasion in classical Greek history, we hear of a feigned withdrawal. The Spartans would approach the enemy and then in lockstep and on order, backpedal, drawing the Persians in, in which they would then suddenly form a rigid line and kill them even more easily as they were out of order and uh, undisciplined. 
usually was considered beyond the realm of Greek tactics. Why did it happen at Thermopylae? Probably a combination of Spartan discipline and the nature of the pass. It was narrow. If they were to do that in a regular battlefield, they might easily be outflanked. Stunned by the ever-mounting losses, Xerxes ordered the immortals to retreat. As the day drew to a close, Leonidas and his allies had triumphed against all the odds. They must have felt vindicated. Everything that they had been taught, that they were superior because of their tremendous discipline, seemed at that moment to be true. And even though they must have recognized that this can't go on forever, the feeling of their demonstrated superiority against the biggest empire in the known world must have been a source of a great deal of pride. In the Persian camp, after his bad day, Xerxes was reeling. The Mopoli must have been an enormously frustrating experience for Xerxes. He'd waited days expecting the Spartans to retreat, and they hadn't. He'd lost thousands of men when he shouldn't have done. And to cap all of that, he lost two of his own brothers. He was emotionally absolutely exhausted, and Herodotus tells us, incredibly angry. Troops who had fought poorly are said to have paid the ultimate price. Xerxes' navy had also suffered. Opposite Thermopylae, the Athenian fleet had sunk many Persian ships, keeping Leonidas safe from sea attack. According to Herodotus, although they knew next to nothing about naval warfare, a Spartan had been appointed admiral of the Athenian fleet. The logic for this appointment was simple. A Spartan admiral would not know a great deal, probably, about maneuvering in detail. That was Athenian territory. But that kind of maneuvering wasn't what was planned. The fleet opposite Thermopylae was to be static, it was to block. Its main aim was not to run away. And if there's one thing the Spartans were good at, it was not running away. As the second day of battle dawned, Xerxes tried to break the deadlock once again. But the Spartan infantry continued its killing spree to devastating effect. As the day wore on, the pass at Thermopylae became a cauldron of death, piled high with mutilated and rotting Persian corpses. The smell, blood, feces, plus the hot sun corrupting what was left and producing an even worse smell, um, it, it just doesn't bear thinking about. At the end of the second day, Xerxes was facing the stark reality that his greatest resource, numerical superiority, counted for nothing. It's very quickly coming to his senses that these Greeks fight better and kill his men, and there doesn't seem any solution to this problem that he got himself into, that numbers for the first time in his life don't mean anything. If numbers for a Persian king don't mean anything, you have no other resources to draw on. Persian numbers may have meant nothing, but Persian gold still counted for a lot. According to Herodotus, a local Greek called Ephialtes came forward and offered to sell information to Xerxes that could win him the battle. The attractions of Persian gold, which we're told by Herodotus is what induced him to betray the Greeks, was well known in Greek history to exert a mesmerizing effect on Greeks and that was one of the ways in which Persia traditionally controlled Greek city-states by dishing out lots of cash. It said that in return for gold, Ephialtes showed the Persians the Anopia Pass that led round to the back of the Spartan position. 
the path was well known. It was inevitable that somebody was going to tell the Persians of its existence. There were so many locals who were backing Xerxes. They wanted the Persians to win and couldn't stand the Spartans. 10,000 immortals marched up the secret pass. All that stood in their way was a contingent of Phocians, local Greeks who didn't have the benefit of Spartan training. There's some 1,000 of them, and they only have one order, that is, make sure that the pass is not turned. And what happens? Ephialtes leads the Persians around to the rear of Leonidas. The Phocians see them, they panic, they go up to the heights, and in the process, they leave the pass open. The Phocians took one look at them and scrambled off like rabbits um, and let the, the Persian force through. As Xerxes immortals set off up the steep mountain pass, Leonidas would also have been seeking a means of ending the deadlock. Five hundred years after the battle, a Roman historian suggested that Leonidas might have tried guerrilla tactics to win the war at a stroke. Years of hunting rebellious helot slaves at night meant the Spartans had the skills to assassinate Xerxes under cover of darkness. The notion of knocking out the one man who holds together this disparate force is not entirely implausible. The Spartans were the masters of night behavior. Of all Greeks, a small squadron of Spartans might just conceivably have been able to get as near to Xerxes as this source says they did and conceivably even assassinate Xerxes in his tent. If an attempt was made to assassinate Xerxes, it failed. By morning, the immortals would have crossed the mountain path and be marching towards the Greek position from the rear. The Spartans and their allies were surrounded. As day three of the battle loomed, the Spartans and their king were determined to hold fast. Even now, retreat or surrender was unthinkable. I don't see any genuine choices for Leonidas and his Spartans at that point, nor do I suppose that they really have wanted a choice. That's almost an Athenian thought, that you should have a choice at this moment uh, of crisis. I think uh, it's a Spartan thought to look you in the eye and say, there is no choice. It's simply a matter of duty. But Leonidas did not expect his allies to be bound by the same standards as the Spartans. According to Herodotus's history, Leonidas allowed the other Greek allies to retreat. But for a small band of Thebans and Thespians who decided to stay, the Spartans would face the enemy alone. This was the moment that they had been born for. In my opinion, Leonidas knew exactly what he was doing, knew exactly the myth that he was creating at this moment. And I think all the other 300 knew it too. The Spartans prepared for battle with their usual sacrifices. According to Herodotus, the omens were clear. Even the gods had deserted them now. We hear that when the Spartans sacrificed an animal before their final engagement, the omens were bad. And if Spartans started their fighting that day, knowing that the omens were wrong, they would be anticipating their own deaths. The gods had warned them not to fight. Just as the Delphic Oracle had foreseen, a Spartan king would die fighting Persia. All that remained was for Leonidas to die well.
when you're going to be surrounded, the question is how do you want to die and how long do you want to die and how many people you want to take with them. So I think that was the Spartan new idea, that it wasn't to save Greece. It was now simply to make a statement about Greek courage and to prolong uh, the Persian agony as much as possible. As a Spartan and as a king, Leonidas was above all a professional soldier and he was above all a commander of men. And so at the final moment when push came to shove, uh, Leonidas would not have had a shadow of doubt as to where his duty lay. At the head of his few remaining men, Leonidas faced the Persians one last time. Surrounded, he could no longer defend the pass, so he led his troops in a final attack, killing as many Persians as possible. But he could never kill enough. Leonidas's life had been brutal. His death was glorious. Despite losing their leader, the remaining Spartans fought on, determined to make the Persians pay dearly for every last drop of Greek blood. Even if they had to fight without weapons. After their spears were broken or got lost, the Spartans resorted to their swords, which was most unusual. After the same happened to their swords, Herodotus tells us that they fought with anything they had, with their teeth, with their fingernails. Even then, when their swords were broken, their spears were gone, and they were reduced to their hands and teeth. A Spartan was not an animal that any Persian wanted to come close to. Herodotus describes the Persian attack on them with a verb that indicates arrows. To die under a hail of arrows would be perhaps worse than dying with a spear in your groin. So the Spartans were taught to abuse arrows. They were taught to see them as attractor, as spindles, as women's things. According to Herodotus, not a single Spartan survived the Battle of Thermopylae. The victorious Persians found Leonidas's body among the piles of dead and took it to Xerxes. Xerxes took the very unusual step of getting hold of the corpse of Leonidas, beheading it and sticking the head on a pike. Now that kind of behavior wasn't altogether unheard of in the ancient world, but the Persians didn't normally do it. They honored men who distinguished themselves in battle. They saw them as, as true heroes and tended to respect their corpses enormously. Xerxes did this because he was really, really angry. What happened to Leonidas was quite sad because they hide the other bodies, so the heroism, all of the uh, physical evidence of the battlefield will be hidden. And then they literally set up a tourist bureau and have boats to bring over other Greeks so that they see this hideous, this grotesque, head of a Spartan king on a stake as a sign that Persia is superior to the Greeks. The line had not been held. 
Xerxes' troops descended on Athens and burnt it to the ground. Tactically, Thermopylae was the worst defeat in the history of Sparta. Strategically, it was a wonderful victory. How can that be possible? The pass was turned, the fleet withdrew, but it was the psychological drama that Greeks had held off the Persian Empire, not just the Persian army, for three days. And that gave enormous psychological capital to the defenders to the rear. Inspired by the Spartans' heroic stand, the Greek forces regrouped to the south. Within a year, the Athenian navy would defeat Xerxes' fleet, and the Persian king would be forced into a humiliating retreat. Xerxes withdrew to Persia, never to return. If the Persians had won, there would have been no democracy in Athens. If there'd been no democracy in Athens, there would have been no Athenian politics, no Athenian theatre, no Athenian philosophy. An awful lot of what we call our cultural heritage would simply never have happened. The events at Thermopylae would change the course of history forever. Greek culture and civilization were able to flourish. But Sparta's harsh warrior cult would survive for less than a hundred years. Their helot slaves successfully revolted and Sparta's dominance came to an end. Only the legend lives on. Sparta really was, in many ways, a nightmarish society. It was capable of a moment of self-sacrifice that one has to respect. And yet, if we embrace the values that I see Sparta standing for, I think we've lost everything that really matters about freedom. And yet, maybe that freedom wasn't possible without that moment at Thermopylae. It's an odd thought. And next on BBC Two, the horrors of the trenches as a team of experts and relations search for the site of a First World War siege. Ancestors journey to hell in a moment. The greatest heroes of antiquity, the Spartan king, Leonidas. Here, Leonidas took on the might of the Persian Empire with just a tiny Greek defense force and stopped it in its tracks. Legend says that Leonidas' struggle against King Xerxes saved Western democracy at the very moment of its birth. The minute it happened, it immediately vaulted into legend. We look back 2,500 years and it seems ancient, it seems mythological to us, we can't even tell if it's real or if it, but it really happened. It was a historical event. We know who was there, we know the names, it really happened. But with Thermopylae, few facts are certain. Almost all we know about the battle, and the Spartans themselves, comes from the ancient historian Herodotus, writing from a Greek perspective more than 40 years after the battle. Herodotus was responding to stories that he was told by the Spartans when he visited Sparta. And the Spartans had already put together their version of events by the time Herodotus came to write his history. So, Herodotus himself was gathering a partly mythologized version. The legend of the Spartans at the Battle of Thermopylae reverberated down the ages. Historians and artists transformed Leonidas and his men into mythical figures 
until their battle for Greece became seen as a fight for the entire Western world. In the Western imagination, the story of Thermopylae is the... All babies were examined to check that they conformed to the Spartan ideal. At the age of seven, a boy would have been removed from his family and taught the Spartan ways. Young Spartans were brought up and educated communally by the state from, uh, we're told, the age of seven. And uh, this education was intended to inculcate physical toughness, um, military skill, and above all, obedience. Living together in barracks, the boys learned comradeship. And deprived of all comforts, they were molded into austere Spartans through extreme physical hardship. The boys were deliberately given not enough to eat, and also they were encouraged to steal to augment their uh, meager rations, and uh, they were whipped if they were caught. Not because stealing was a crime, but because they were clumsy thieves. The eyes of Sparta were everywhere. When a boy reached puberty, he was considered to be particularly dangerous. The boys were always supervised, every moment of every day. Spartans felt that boys, teenagers, were at a particularly dangerous age. They might go off the rails. They had to be policed every minute to make sure that the values of the ruling group were transmitted. Spartan girls were given some sort of formal education and they had some sort of exercise allegedly naked in front of the boys. Persia was the largest empire the Western world had ever seen. From its center in modern-day Iran, it stretched from India to Egypt. Greece was just a tiny speck on its western horizon. Persia was a world empire. It included 28 nations. It had all the resources it, it ever wanted. It had all the money it ever wanted and controlled something that nobody before them had ever controlled. The Persians looked like they could take over the world, but it would be some years before they realized that they would have to get past the Spartans first. In Sparta, Persia would find a military machine like no other. Closed to the outside world, Sparta's people thought they were a chosen super race, and with extreme laws and ideals, they planned to stay that way. To maintain discipline, everyone in Sparta was always under surveillance. A group of ultra-conservative old men called the Gorousia looked for signs of non-conformity. Watching the Gorousia was another group of officials, the Ephors. Even royalty wasn't above suspicion. A Spartan king wasn't a monarch. It was a diarchy. There were two of them, carefully watching each other, being rivals, and knowing that if they stepped out of line, the ephors might get them. The king could be put on trial, could be exiled, and his character systematically ruined in the eyes of history. No one escaped Sparta's judgmental gaze. Most important example of heroic self-sacrifice for country. The simple message is that it's better to be dead than unfree. Leonidas came from a secretive and violent society, totally at odds with the rest of Greece. Their presence at one of the key battles for freedom has intrigued Western scholars for centuries. 
for 2,500 years, people have been arguing about them, never agreeing as to who they were, what they did, why they did it. The Spartans have left a wonderful mythical paper trail that nobody has really succeeded in sorting out. Today, very little remains of Sparta, the most isolated and secretive city-state in ancient Greece. But in Leonidas's time, this remote valley was home to the most feared warriors in the Mediterranean. And unlike other Greeks, who spent most of the year farming, all Spartans were full-time warriors. Every time you faced the Spartan army, you faced a mass of identically, perfectly trained Spartans. You were not really confronting even mortal man. You were confronting sort of this eternal notion of unbeatable Sparta. Leonidas was master of his own realm and feared in many more, but his supremacy was about to be challenged. This is a land where the weak are enslaved and killed. Violence is every man's daily bread, and a dead husband is every woman's dream. Here children expect to be beaten for their own good, sometimes to death. This is the fabled warrior kingdom of Sparta. Soon it will be the unlikely savior of the free world. The cradle of Western civilization is under attack. King Xerxes and his quarter of a million strong Persian army are invading Greece. In the first major struggle between East and West, the slave-owning Spartans and their King Leonidas will be transformed into glorious heroes. Over the next two and a half thousand years, their heroic stand will become a legend. The two forces would meet at Thermopylae, the gates of fire and on the outcome would hang the fate of Western democracy itself. This is Thermopylae, the scene of one of the most glorified slaughters in history. Many thousands died here The smell of death and decay still hangs in the air as sulfurous hot springs pour their stench down the mountainside. Given the battlefield its name, Thermopylae, the hot gates, the gates of fire. A solitary figure surveys the battlefield.